Uh, hello. Thanks for coming. There have been some unexpected changes to the schedule, so I hope that this really is the talk that you want to attend. We'll talk about AI today, <laughs> not anything else. Uh, okay, so for first I'll introduce myself. My name is Rafał. I've been fortunate enough to uh, dedicate most of my, most of my uh, career to AI in game dev, starting with mobile games, but then transitioning to, to uh, tactical and strategic ones. And for the, for the most part, I've worked in QED software as uh, head of AI development, where we uh, developed a framework for uh, AI in games called Grail, and, and also doing work for hire for different companies implementing AI, basically. And right now we are starting a new company called QED Games that will deal exclusively with tech for games and with making our own, our own games. All right. Uh, the topic of today's talk is a little bit niche, but I think that uh, it will be uh, interesting for those of you who, who want to change something in uh, AI in your games, who want to like break out from the uh, from the stale te techniques of, of behavior trees and FSMs, but still are a little bit afraid to uh, uh, double in such techniques as utility AI, because, it, for example, like, like the conceptual complexity may scare you. So I want to give you a, a specific set of advices that would like make it easier for you to reason about those systems. First, I'll briefly, like for the first 10 minutes, I'll introduce uh, utility AI. I'll explain what, what it is, actually. Uh, so for those of you who already know, sorry, <laughs> but I want to build a common, common understanding of this. Then I'll show you uh, one little trick to, <laughs> to handle complexity of such systems and show you the um, connection between utility AI systems and fuzzy logic systems and how we can use this, this uh, correspondence to reason about utility AI. And then I'll show you some videos of toy examples uh, using this. Right. Uh, so let's start with the introduction. This is uh, like the topmost view of utility AI uh, as I could imagine. So basically, it's a bag of possible behaviors that your agents, your NPCs can exhibit. And then all those behaviors are rated, scored. And based on this score, the best one is selected. That's all, basically. So <laughs> uh, if we want to add some more detail, it look like, looks like this. So you have a cloud of something called a game state, basically the state of your game in the engine. You have lots of possible behaviors, and each of those behaviors is coupled with an evaluator. And the evaluator is a, a creature that accepts the game state, or, or various aspects of the game state, and spits out a score, a value, a floating, floating point number. Um, I want to make a few, a few remarks about implementation details. So, from the point of view of these systems, of, of uh, utility AI systems, we don't care about the particulars of particular implementations of behaviors. So they can be anything. They can be behavior trees, FSMs, like dump scripts, anything. This technique um, is a decision-making technique and not behavior steering technique. So yeah, it, 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 its role is to select the best behavior in a given in a given circumstance, in given circumstances. Um, there can be many or uh, single or many instances of um, behaviors of a, of a particular type. So, for example, you can have a single fight behavior that's selected, but you can also try to instance many different fight behaviors, for example, for different groups of enemies or for individual enemies, even. For example, when you have melee using all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as I said before, those scores are represented as floating point numbers, and they don't have to be confined to any range. But as I'll show you uh, in the in the um, how do you say this in the in the maybe not in the next slide in the next section uh, it pays off to uh, deliberately, deliberately it's a hard word confine yourself to to a, a specific range. All right. Yeah. Uh, so this is the anatomy of an uh, of a utility evaluator. Uh, basically, those purple uh, blocks. This is the representation of the game state that was purple on the, on the previous slide. So basically, from the point of view of, the, of those evaluators, we represent the state as an array of floating point numbers again. Uh, the system doesn't care about implementation of those blocks, about the implementation of those blocks. It just expects them to, to provide a value, a single value. Then 
And those considerations are transformed into a common range uh, by mathematical curves, basically, and they can be of many different types. And then on those values that are output from, from the curves, we perform various operation, uh, operations, like aggregate, aggregating them by a, by a minimum, or, or maybe we can multiply them. We can do all sorts of stuff uh, on, on, those, on those values. And then the result of, uh, of these all operations is like a single score that's attached to a given behavior. Mm. This is uh, the thing that I've already told you. A consideration is a single parameter, like enemy health, your own health, a distance to a peekaboo, uh, some threat estimation. This data can come from an external system. It can be pre-computed. It can be uh, computed on the fly. We don't care from the point of view of this system. Uh, but it has, to, it has to output a single value. Mm. Aggregators are any operators that accept many different inputs and spit out a single value. So you can have a product, a sum, a mean, a max, anything. <clears throat> but the most important part of, of, this, uh, of this whole idea are those, those uh, mathematical curves. And they can come in many shapes and sizes. They can be linear, nonlinear, interpolated, Bezier, whatever you wish. And their role is to transform like, those considerations that can come in different, uh, in different values then they don't have any common unit. For example, you have distance in meters and HP, which, which is an abstract unit, like health of the agent. And you want those, uh, to, to transform those disparate units into a single space that they can be dealt with in, the, in this abstract space. Um, yeah, typically, they are uh, uh, single input functions, like mapping from real numbers to real numbers. But uh, you can imagine multi-dimensional curves. Uh, though I haven't seen anyone who, who implemented such a system, because it's very difficult for design, de designers to like, uh, tweak uh, surfaces in 3D. <laughs> it, will be, uh, it wouldn't be really manageable. But you can try to, for example, use some uh, machine learning techniques to adjust those, those high-dimensional high-dimensional curves, but I haven't, as I said, I haven't seen anyone do this. Uh, and for sure, you cannot just hold those, those curves in your mind and imagine like values of square roots <laughs> for, for different values. So you, you have to, absolutely, you have to have uh, some kind of a visualization tool or prototyping tool so that you can see what's happening. Uh, you cannot like just code it and, and expect to know what would, what, what would happen in, in, in various situations. Okay, so uh, here's a shitty video that's too small, but we don't care. Uh, basically, what it shows is an example of a simple evaluator. When you have a consideration, a curve, and another curve, so we can stack those curves, then the, like, we don't expect uh, there to be a single one. And as you can see, as I move the value of the, of the consideration, this value gets, uh, gets transformed and outputs some, some other value. All right. <clears throat> and another thing, uh, and this is like the, the last step of complexifying the, the whole system, is introducing subtrees, like evaluate, uh, evaluator subtrees. Because uh, it, as it turns out, typically in more complex configurations, you keep on reusing the same sets of blocks. Like you have a health and you have it uh, um, paired with uh, a given curve, and then you reuse the same consideration and the same curve, even in the same evaluation tree. So <laughs> we just, to, to reduce like the complexity, the visual, visual complexity of the systems, we can introduce subtrees so that it, it may become, it, it may look like this. So we define a single subtree and then reuse it across, uh, across the, uh, the evaluator, but also across different uh, evaluators. Yeah. The main benefit of using those subtrees is simply reuse, uh, reuse, reuse of configuration. So you, for example, can uh, make some changes to a single utility curve and affect many different behaviors, many different evaluations of behaviors. So, um, like, so you, you keep all those values harmonized when you change, for example, a curve that represents in your head a concept of low health. You want this to be consistent across evaluators so that you, and you don't want your AI designers or programmers to like to run through all your <laughs> evaluators and change the same thing. So uh, it's, it's, it really pays off to introduce such, uh, such uh, subtrees in your, into your system. All right, so let's summarize the whole technique. 
We represent the world state as consideration, meaning single float parameters, transform them using curves, aggregate op uh, use aggregation operations on the values that are spit out by those curves, and then we um, obtain scores and select behaviors based on those scores. For example, using the maximum operation or roulette selection if you want to, uh, to add some randomness, anything like this. The <clears throat> advantages of, this, of those systems is um, that are they are very easy to maintain. You can, because there are no uh, couplings or um, like hard dependencies between behaviors. You just deal with pools of possible behaviors. Uh, you can easily like add a new one, remove an old one, and nothing will happen. Like nothing bad will happen. <laughs> uh, and and the, the whole system should still work uh, because we operate on an abstract value space and not on like some concrete thresholds or boolean uh, or, or boolean parameters. Boolean conditions uh, and those sorts of stuff. It's very, uh, very performant because it's just simple floating point operation, operations. And right now, I can say that it's maybe it's not the most popular uh, technique in game dev, but it's battle tested already. Uh, many games use those systems in slight, in maybe in slight uh, variations. Um, for example, in uh, Divinity Original Sin, it was not like your common utility AI, but Utility AI uh, applied to whole game states, but the premise was the same. Okay, so what are the, the disadvantages? I'm slightly biased, so I found only two. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the first one is uh, loss of control. If you, uh, if you want your NPCs to behave like in a specified manner to perform like specific actions in spe at specific time, uh, in specific se sequences, this is not the technique for you. So, uh, like, I if you, you make linear shooters, maybe, maybe it's not, not just not for you. If you want uh, to control the behavior very tightly, just use behavior trees. But the, <clears throat> the most important disadvantage for, for me is that those, uh, those evaluators can be very hard to reason about because like, there are a, a bunch of numbers and curves, and if for, uh, for people new to this, they are very hard to reason about. So now I'll show you the trick that I mentioned at the start. Um, like the main rule of thumb for me is that for humans, typically, it's, it's easier to reason about in language, in language, in the rules, than in numbers. So uh, when designing a behavior of an agent, we want to start with a description, like in, in your natural language, in English. Uh, and, a, and here you can see two example uh, rules. If an agent is healthy and an enemy, uh, the enemy is not super strong, then you should attack. And as you can see, I uh, mm, marked in bold like those cloudy, fuzzy concepts like healthy or not super high, whatever they mean. And uh, this representation like uh, brings to our minds two important questions, two important issues. First. Uh, what if multiple such rules are true at the same time? So uh, the agent is healthy, enemy is not super healthy, the agent's uh, health is not super high. What if everything is true at the, at the same time? Then we have like multiple, multiple behaviors that should be selected. So that's not good. And another one is how do we, how do we actually transform those sentences, this description, into a configuration? That's uh, numeric. Uh, oh, I'm showing you the... Uh, I'm showing you the web browser, I just noticed. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, okay, so now that we've mentioned those behavior rules, we need some language in which we can, we can create those rules. So let's introduce fuzzy logic. <clears throat> in normal uh, Boolean logic, you would have like predicates based on statements, like an agent is healthy or is not healthy, a simple Boolean logic. And uh, this is not very useful in games because some of those facts can be a little bit true or maybe not true at all, but uh, like the agent can, can have like 0.9 health. So the agent is healthy, but it's not fully healthy, so we need to somehow fuzzify, fuzzify those labels. And we do this by introducing so-called classes, uh, classes 
to which an agent can have a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy degree of membership. So we create a healthy class, and, and an agent can belong to this class with some degree that's confined to zero to one. So you can think of, uh, think of zero as like the value representing the least true, <laughs> like the fact that it's the least true, and one, uh, the fact that it's the most true in a given situation. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, in fuzzy logic, we do a thing that's very, very similar to what we do in utility AI. We basically take a continuous value and plug it into some membership curve, so-called membership curve. And this, this process is called fuzzification, and it's very, very similar to, uh, to uh, transforming considerations by curves. The only difference is that we require that those values are from the range from zero to one. And as soon as we have our basic facts, the representation of them, we want uh, to write sentences, clauses. So we need connectives like and, or, we need negation. Uh, so we can define uh, various different operators on floating uh, point values that um, preserve our, our intuitions about normal Boolean logic. For example, we can represent OR as a maximum operation or something more complex. Uh, the same goes for AND. We can see, simply use a minimum operation, but also a product or something even more. This, this last one is called, called Wukasiewicz norm. Um, and negation. <laughs> also, <laughs> also can have many different representations, but we'll stick to the three most most uh, like straightforward straightforward ones: uh, mean, max for or, mean for and, and one minus x for negation. And, and this is a whole clause uh, built of those of those fuzzy concepts. So if I want to say that health is high or enemy health is low and enemy armor is not high then I can construct such a tree-like structure where on the top level I have those continuous considerations, then curves representing membership functions, returning from, uh, values from zero to one, and then our aggregators become connectives in fuzzy logic. And normally in fuzzy logic systems, when used for steering or control, like re regulating some, uh, oh, maybe for driving cars, if you would use these systems for, for continuous control, you would have an additional step of defuzzification, meaning that you would take those membership um, evaluations and turn them into a single number. But we don't need this here, so I won't discuss defuzzification uh, in this presentation. Okay, so now that I've introduced utility AI and fuzzy logic, and you, uh, I hope that you have seen many similarities between those two uh, like, uh, concepts or, or modes of thinking. Uh, I will show you how to, um, how to connect them together. Uh, so first, we, of, of course, we have to ensure that the curve outputs of our utility AI system is in, uh, for, uh, in, in zero to one range. Uh, our curves become membership functions to those classes like healthy or, or uh, nearby or something like this. Some of our aggregation uh, operations, min and max, become connectives in fuzzy logic, and we can define something that I call concepts uh, that correspond directly to subtrees in those evaluators. And I'll show you a, a little image of this um, later. And as soon as we have our concepts defined, we want to connect them only using those uh, fuzzy logic connectives. So we don't use any sums or, uh, I don't know, uh, square roots or anything. We just use those min, max, and negation operations. Uh, so this is how we would define a concept. Uh, we would like define a consideration and the membership function, as you can probably imagine. Then we can build a whole, whole rules for behaviors using those concepts. So uh, we, we don't have like a row row considerations and row curves in these evaluation uh, trees, but we use the predefined concepts. For example, the agent should attack an enemy if the agent's health is high and enemy health, uh, enemy's health is low. Uh, also, we can, uh, we can reuse, this, this is the main point, we can take this concept of high health and reapply re re it to an evaluator associated with getting a medkit. And then if you want to change 
what it means for, the, for health to be high, you can simply change it in one place and both those evaluators would be affected. Uh, so basically what we've done right now is we, we've defined necessary conditions for various behaviors to make sense. So, yeah, for example here, it only makes sense to fetch a medkit if your health is uh, not high. But uh, still, we can have multiple medkits on our level, and it may make sense to pick any one of them. So we need to uh, introduce some kind of uh, preference ordering, uh, so that the agent, uh, for example, prefers uh, the medkits that are m closer to him, or maybe the, uh, the ones that are bigger or give more, more HP, or anything like this. And we also want to express uh, preferences like behavioral preferences of different agents. So you, you would have like a tank who would have an attack, uh, attack behavior that uh, has the same necessary conditions as attack behavior of your archer, but the preference for targets would be different. So you, you would like to reuse the, the necessary conditions but change the preferences. Uh, so how do we model this? I propose to separate the evaluated trees into two sections. The first one is the one we've already discussed, those fuzzy rules, and then we can couple the rule for a given behavior with a preference modifier. And the preference modifier is basically another evaluation tree. That we, For example, we can multiply the, the whole value by this modifier, or we can add it, we can add a, a constant or whatever we want to do. And, and what I propose is to think about those, is, is to design those evaluators by strictly adhering to fuzzy logic reasoning in this, left, uh, in this uh, left section. And here we can do anything we want. So we, we can like, do summations or uh, any, any exotic stuff that modifies, like, for example, we can modify the maximum, the maximum preference that a given behavior can have. Mm. And uh, the benefit that we gain from this is that we can reuse those purple blocks across different agents and only modify those blue ones. So here is a full-blown uh, behavior rule. Here we have our necessary conditions, like health is low or health is not high, but the medkit is nearby. And here we have a modifier that basically uh, sorts the medkits by distance. And this is how it looks. Uh, so let's proceed to the, to the advantages of the rule-based uh, approach. First, we get no sign flips because if you ensure that your values are strictly between 0 and 1, you get no weird behavior related to uh, something suddenly changing a sign and then half of your behavior ha have uh, like uh, negative values. So, uh, so it's a safeguard. Uh, you create a common descri behavior description standard that your designers, if you have many people working on AI, they instantly will understand each other's configurations because they will adhere to the common common language uh, that expresses preferences of behaviors. Of course, we can re reuse those concepts. Uh, we can reuse them even across different NPCs. And what's more, most important for me is that we, we can very easily transition between a description in a language, in a, in a natural language and numeric, uh, numeric configuration. Meaning that uh, like your non-AI guys, like lead designer, for example, can have a vision for, a, for, a, for an agent's behavior. And he can easily communicate to AI people what is needed, and they can uh, translate it into a configuration by themselves, like by basically taking those sentences and translating them into, into fuzzy logic. Uh, but uh, this approach, of course, is not perfect. It requires a lot of discipline. You have to be on your watch to, to not let any of those values to, to step out of the, of the allowed range. It may seem very artificial to some, because if, especially if, if someone is uh, already experienced in utility AI, uh, they may have done it a different way for like a few years, and this approach can seem very, very artificial to them. Uh, and <clears throat> the main thing that... Uh, the main issue uh, regarding complexity that st still remains uh, is that on those, in, in those final evaluator trees, many things, is, uh, many things are hidden. So you can't, uh, can't see what considerations are used at the first glance, and you cannot see like individual curves and their shapes. So uh, 
you would need like basically uh, you need to build build visualization and configuration tools that will help you uh, with with those with those problems. And maybe maybe some ideas cannot be expressed this way, but I I don't know I haven't found any. <coughs> this is the summary of the whole process. First, you ensure that the outputs of curves are in uh, zero to one range to make it a fuzzy logic system. Use uh, typical aggregation operators as connectives. Define basic concepts, then combine those concepts, and here you have, here you have a, a, like normal utility evaluators that are easy to think about. All right. So now that we've uh, gone through the, the whole process of uh, of defining our terms and and uh, explaining the uh, the whole approach, I will show you some. Uh, toy examples, like really minimal examples with two behaviors, so that you get a glimpse of how it would look like in, in the real world. So this is, uh, this is our, uh, our evaluator for getting a med kit, meaning health is low, and the value returned by health is low is modified but by some modifier uh, that's based on, this, on, it, on, on distance from the med kit. And the first, the first version looks like this. We have two guys, the blue guy. The blue guy is controlled by utility AI, then another one is just a simple script that approaches the, the blue guy and shoots. So they start shooting at each other, and then as uh, the blue, blue agent's health drops, he starts running for the medkit, but doesn't manage to do so. So clearly the, there, there is something wrong with our conception of high health, the, the, or low health. Uh, the agent should decide much quicker that, oh, my health is getting low, I should run for the medkit. So the, the only thing that we have to modify in such a system is to take a curve representing low health and tweak it a little, a little bit. So the, the initial one was uh, to, uh, between 0 and 27, the, the health was considered uh, to be low, and then the lowness of health decreased rapidly. And we can change it to such a configuration that uh, between uh, 0 and 0.4, the health is considered strictly low, and then the lowness decreases very gradually and is considered not to be low, uh, completely not low, <laughs> uh, uh, like basically at almost the maximum health. And here is the, the result that we get from this. Basically, everything looks the same at, at the beginning. But as soon as the, as the health will drop, you can see that the agent starts running for the, uh, the medkit much quicker. And then uh, the whole thing repeats. And yeah, and this is the behavior that we wanted. And also we can different, uh, uh, like the, the getting the medkit when the health is low is such a common thing that we'd like to reuse it across different, uh, different sorry, not languages, but different agents. Uh, only, for example, changing those preferences that I've talked about. So this agent runs to the nearest medkit right away, but maybe we would want a, a type of agent that prefers medkits that are further away to save those closer ones for others, for example. So the only thing that we change here is our distance modifier curve. The first one was a decreasing curve, a curve that decreased with distance, uh, very slowly, as you can see here, we have 800 meters. So, like the, the rate of decrease of this of this uh, curve is very very slow, and it serves a role of basically sorting by distance. And we can transform it into a, uh, into such curve when uh, med kids that are nearby are slightly slightly less preferable to those that are far away. And this completely changes the behavior of the agent. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a toy example, like the, the, the smallest possible example that I could imagine. But I hope that you can like, extrapolate this concept to, to situations where you have like tens of behaviors and many different state parameters. And I hope that I've managed to convince you that it increases uh, manag manageability of those, of those systems and makes them more, more approachable and understandable. Um, Okay, so this is all that I've prepared for you today. So if you have any, any questions, please ask away. This is our AI framework.
Thanks. So I enjoyed uh, your talk. And my question is, isn't this a bit hard in debugging? I mean, I can imagine many instances where some weird corner cases or exact values happen to produce an unexpected behavior. And how hard is it to find what exactly causes it and how to fix it via tweaking the curves or something? Um, it depends on the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, basically, if you want to uh, make this functional, you need some debugging tools that would let you like dump the whole state of those evaluator trees so that you can compare different evaluations in a given, in a given time. If you don't have something like this, it will be a chore. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so my question is, uh, in your experience, or maybe in your opinion, how this utility AI fuzzy uh, logic approach sh could be effective in like MOBA games in the multiplayer online battles? When, for example, we have like 5v5 battle and not all of these are real players, some of them bots. So is there any upsides, downsides, or? Um, I don't think that the genre is is uh, important, but like more uh, the complexity the, the complexity of behaviors or, or decision making that you have to have in your game, and so if if you expect those agents to behave behave in a nonlinear fashion and interpolate when you when you when you design those utility systems, you typically have some concrete situations in mind. For example, oh, my health is very low, and in this, in this instance, I should go to get a medkit. But uh, if something happens in the game that's not, uh, that's something a little bit different than what you imagined, this technique will still like, interpolate the behavior, because those values are continuous, so uh, you don't get things, uh, like you get things with, with uh, normal Boolean conditions, or like something is, 0 0.001 higher than the threshold, and something weird starts happening. So this, this, if you if you need like emergent, emergent, non-predictable behavior, yeah, I think that this is the right technique. Yeah, I also have a question here from the back. Uh, first, thanks for the talk. Uh, just a quick idea, because uh, the definitions that you showed, just like health is high or the distance to the mechic, sound fixed. But is there any way to get like a more contextual approach to it? Because, for example, in a peaceful location, a high health can mean 40%, and it can still be high because I don't expect danger. But in other locations where I expect a lot of enemies, even 70% stat might mm -hmm. be a low health that I should search for help. Because right now, how would I approach such a thing? I w I, would I need different definitions for an expect context or maybe some modifier? Do you yeah, have yeah. any idea how to approach that? As far as I can think of, yes, you would need like different different definitions, but maybe there's some cool trick like uh, using a modifier, context-dependent modifier that would multiply the value. So uh, just as we defined the, those whole, sorry, I'll find it, uh, this whole uh, operation as a, a rule piece and a modifier piece, that maybe inside those concepts, those atomic concepts, you could also introduce such modifiers. That are uh, that uh, are based on the context of a given agent, but I haven't done anything like this, so I'm not sure. You would have to like try try it for yourself. Thanks. Okay. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you. I wanted to ask if this system takes into account situation when, for example, agent received the stimuli, which causes all behaviors to reevaluate. We have a new winner, so it starts to execute this new behavior. Then, next moment, it received another stimuli, reevaluates, and another winner, and so in circles mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. In some instances, it may make sense, like if I'm going to get a snack and there is an explosion, so it makes sense to abandon whatever I'm doing and go to cover. But in other instances, it may just cause like circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two typical solutions. First one is to uh, require your behaviors to, in their interface to return a bool whether the behavior is interruptible or not. This is like the, 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 the simplest one, but uh, it, it doesn't work in many situations <laughs> because you want, sometimes you want the behaviors to be interruptible, but not like switch all the time. So for this, you have to introduce a persistent parameter into your system that would uh, 
like apply a special bonus for the uh, to the to the behavior that is currently selected. So uh, like the new behavior would have to be significantly better to to change the change the behavior. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, sorry, did I interrupt someone? No, no. Hope not. Uh, so I was thinking about how to integrate a bark system with what you proposed, because uh, to so that the players know how awesomely smart our AIs are. Uh, so I'd guess I want the agent to be able to produce some signs of his reasoning in the behavior. So how would you go about that? Okay, this is something that we are, uh, that is in deep R&D right now in our company. Uh, so I have no definite answers for this. You would have to like somehow track, track changes to those individual com uh, considerations and track their contribution to the whole score. And then for example, select the branch of the tree that's, that made, made the most contribution to the overall score. But Still, this is something that we haven't done yet. We are thinking about it, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a good point. It's a good point. Thanks. Okay. And hi. Thank you for yeah. the talk. I have a kind of similar question. Um, if this utility system grows so like 20 or something more parameters, will it be predictable to animation or like outside of the AI system? Uh, yeah. So, so basically. Um, what, what we do in our tech is that the communication with external systems is done via blackboards, like you would do in a behavior tree in, uh, in Unreal. So those considerations have access to blackboards and there, uh, you can store arbitrary data there. So, there. so animation states or some uh, results of external, other external systems that are complex. So we don't assume like a given, a given hmm, representation of the game state. It, 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 f from the point of view of, of individual considerations. So you can put anything, basically. In okay, the but is it a, a two-way... Uh, a, a, mm, okay, my question, follow-up question is, uh, does the AI, will the AI know that you can change the behavior now because you're mid-up or you're like reloading? Mm. And I'm not sure if I understand. Does the AI know... Yeah, can, can the animation tell the AI agent that I'm in the middle of an animation, you can change your behavior okay, now? So, so you would have to uh, trigger some like animation events that would result in some, uh, for example, Boolean value or the uh, interruptibility of a behavior to change. So you'd have to, you'd, you'd have to, to subscribe to some uh, event broadcaster, basically. That would be, uh, and those those events would be invoked by the animation system, communicating to the to the AI, to the AI that you cannot change the behavior right now. Thank you. Uh, my question is somewhat related to the previous question about recalculating uh, plan mm -hmm. on the go. Uh, so in the presented example, the agent preferred the further medkit, but as he approaches it, at some point, it becomes the closer medkit. Yeah, so, yeah. so, how so do this you is the persistence. It? This is the persistence parameter that we define. So, uh, uh, and, no, 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 I, I'm lying to you. The, <laughs> the, uh, in this example, uh, this is the interruptibility uh, parameter. So, uh, the, as soon as the agent approaches, approaches uh, the, the medkit, below a certain distance, the interruptibility switch, switch gets switched. So the behavior uh, becomes non-interruptible. So it has to carry out till the end. Yeah, but what about if something really important happen, uh, happens, yeah, uh, no, like it, an explosion? It's, it's and very, it's and very uh, game specific. So mm -hmm. you'd, you as a developer, you'd have to handle such uh, like interrupts or, or special situations yourself. Hey, uh, do you know any like real-time, uh, real-life examples of using fast logic? I mean, like release games that uh, use yeah, fast logic. Recently, we we have uh, we, in collaboration with Icecode Games, uh, Daniel, who's sitting right there, implemented uh, utility-based AI for Hardwest 2, for example. This is the latest one that we've uh, that we've done, and basically this is the same approach. So uh, there are like thousands of possible behaviors, and they are evaluated using using those systems. And maybe another question, do you think it is somehow narrowed down to a specific genre of games or uh, can it be used everywhere? 
Yeah, I have to say that we, as a company, we are special, very much specialized in tactical and strategic games. So we don't, for example, we don't have much experience, uh, like personal experience with uh, shooters, for example. Uh, so because uh, tactical games and strategic games tend to be very AI heavy, so naturally we fell into the niche of, of those games. But I don't think that the technique itself is limited to those. It seems like uh, the, the biggest usage will be for, for the games where the AI have big autonomy, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So definitely yes. not like a scripted games kind of, right? Yeah, so, so in, like in, in Call of Duty, I would advise not to use this because it would like break the fun. Sure, thanks. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, regarding the videos you showed us, uh, if I would like the blue guy to um, get in position to pick up the med kit, like get close to it in anticipation of what's going to happen, he's going to get damaged, how would you go about modifying the example? Mm, you would have to introduce a, a, a kind of a special consideration. For example, uh, damage change rate, uh, sorry, health change rate and then uh, like take into account the rate of and for example some uh, or or oh maybe maybe this will be the best one you would have health ch and change rate and then you can like uh, get a difference of them and the reason about the difference and not about health itself okay, so if he's getting pounded badly he's going to start moving it to the med kit uh, early, that's right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, in the implementation of the, like, of the rate consideration, you, would, uh, you, would, you, you could put like a time frame that, uh, that the agent can reason about. So uh, in more, for example, if you want the agent to be more careful, you could in increase the time frame so that the agent acts quicker. Uh, do you think that this uh, system could be used to um, uh, for um, characters that have like deep emotions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in like the closest example that I can think of is The Sims, where your your, your characters have lo lo like all sorts of needs, and those needs can be prioritized. For example, using those systems. So, if you, for uh, the last example that we've been thinking thinking about is. Uh, a, for a village, a living village when you have inhabitants and those inhabitants have some needs like uh, shelter, food, all, all sorts of stuff and different agents would have different pr prefer preferences regarding the way in which they would obtain, for example, food. And you can model those preferences using those curves. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I believe that uh, this is the end of the question. So thank you very much for the discussion. <laughs> and, yeah, see you.